Welcome back to Austin P. State University's online theater class. We're in chapter 8 and today we're going to talk about a relatively new position in the theater which is director. You may know this is what I am currently uh, and have for the past couple years become is primarily a director. Um, right now I'm directing Alice's Adventures in Wonderland so you're going to hear lots of examples today from that. Um, director is a title that means different things for different productions. Almost always they are the coach. It's the best metaphor, uh, the most accessible metaphor. They're the coach. They're the ones who keep everybody on the same page, who keep everybody going. They're the cheerleader, the person who points people in the right direction and manages the bear <laughs> that is sometimes the theater. Um, they're also the interpreter. That first uh, word there interprets the play because they have to have a vision. They have to have a perspective on the play and bring a uh, idea to life. But the director, you know, in a musical is can be the choreographer as well or hardly anyone starts out in theater wanting to be a director because it's not a very visual place in the theater. A lot of people work their way up to being a director. Um, like I said, I started off as an actor. Many people start off as designers or and then work their way up to being the director after they see that they can make something that is their own. And that's sort of the joy of directing is, is it, what starts in the imagination gets to come to life on stage, which is really exciting. Um, especially for me in the beginning brainstorming uh, just thinking I get to dream it up and then it gets to become a reality it's a very romantic notion but it is a thankless job many times it's in the shadows you don't get to be part of the curtain call um, and uh, you have to be the boss which can also be um, have its strengths and its weaknesses so as I said, uh, directors, in some cases, you take on some plays and they're pretty straightforward. You know, it's in a house, uh, the actors have definite personalities, but as in the case with Alice in Wonderland and Shakespeare and some of these classic plays, they take quite a bit of interpretation and imagination to make it come to life. Uh, you know, how exactly are we going to stage this? Uh, what direction? You can go to one production of, um, well, let's take, for example, Midsummer Night's Dream, because that's going to be the play that we focus on um, for your character analysis. Uh, you know, I saw two very different versions of Midsummer this uh, past summer. It's kind of confusing. Midsummer Night's Dream, I saw it in the Globe, and uh, it was done very tribal, very um, woods oriented. All the fairies had twigs coming out of their hair, and there was a lot of drum beats, and it was very primal. Um, the lovers in the woods got dirtier and dirtier as the script went on and it felt very much like you were in the trenches and that was fun. And then I went to uh, Nashville Shakespeare uh, in the park and uh, it was very played up the magical side of it. Uh, there was lots of fun recycled goods on stage, very creative, um, you know, sounds there was also drumming in that one but there was uh, lots of flutes and sort of whimsical fairies tons and tons of youth interns who were fairies really played up the magic of it and it was a modern adaptation which was fun too uh, to see you know the, that twist so a director takes this show like Midsummer, and they can create two relatively different uh, looks or styles for the show um, you know, some directors, my favorite director is Julie Taymor, which you may have heard me talk about before. Uh, if you look on page 175 in your book, you can see she directed The Lion King. And she's very much a designer director. The aesthetic, the look of her show is what she's interested. Other directors, um, you know, Susan Stroman, who did The Producers, she's a choreographer director, so she's more interested in movement and comedic timing. So different directors have different visions and their strengths and weaknesses will make their impl uh, imprint on the show. But they their job is to interpret and make sense of a script. And remember a script is not really 
it's a static thing. It's just a beginnings of a play. It's not not the whole package. The director's job is to play the part of the audience. As an actor, it can be sort of unnerving when you can't see uh, what you're doing, if it's working, if it's not working. You can't see if you're melding well with other people. Uh, you can't tell where you're going to get a laugh. So having a director out in the audience to uh, give you feedback, you know, being able to tell you what's working and what's not working for their individual taste, they kind of steer the production from there they stand in for the audience and kind of fight for the audience. So let's take a little jaunt back. Uh, one way to sort of define something is the history of it. And um, we start all the way back with the golden age of theater in ancient Greece. I know we go back here a lot, but it is really the time when a lot of the traditions and the conventions of theater were born. And this is uh, the directors, quote unquote, of the ancient Grecian theater were also the playwrights. Because remember, the playwrights were competing against other playwrights in day long uh, competitions. They would do theater from sun up until sundown, all one person's play. So it was kind of their name on the ballot, their uh, job on the line. And that director who was also the playwright was called teacher, didaskalos, teacher. And they were just the, um, of course, the person uh, steering the ship. Uh, and remember that some of the conventions of the time, the Grecian chorus, only one or two people on stage, meant that actually marking out where the actors stand, which is kind of the main job of a director, practically speaking, is blocking or telling the actors where to stand. It wouldn't have been too difficult, probably. There's only one or two doors to enter from. Uh, the Greek chorus, you know, would probably come in and out of, of different areas of the stage, but for the most part, the blocking is not something super complicated. It's pretty static. So, um, but that playwright and uh, director was just titled generically teacher or didaskalos in the golden age of Greece. Moving on to another golden age of theater, the Elizabethan Renaissance in London. In Shakespeare's time, this is a, a drawing of Richard Burbage. He was uh, uh, one of Shakespeare's best actors. He was a front man. He would have been Hamlet and Hamlet, Iago and Othello. He would have been um, the leading man, uh, the one to kind of steer the ship. And once again, in this time, he would have been the actor and the director. But you have to remember that staging in Shakespeare's plays was very performative. Uh, the main character would stand downstage and elocutionize to the audience and the extras, the hired soldier number one, would stand in the background and um, try not to pick their nose. It wasn't a lot of really dynamic staging. It was very presentational. Let me come downstage and speak at the audience in my light and um, then speak to the other character. Maybe a sword fight, maybe a dance, but for the most part the acting was pretty straightforward and there wasn't a lot of need for a director to stage something that looked realistic. When we did get light bulbs, when electricity came in the 19th century, 19th century that's when we as a theater really came into our own um, because we could you know, do lights up, lights down. We'd, we could recreate times of day. Uh, there was a lot more leniency in the script, and theater became uh, a much more popular pastime to come indoors and enjoy these shows. It was also, uh, it's worth saying, very dangerous. This gas lighting uh, caused lots of fires. Lots of people died in theaters at this time. Um, but uh, it did create a need for a director because now that we're doing realistic drama has come into fashion. Uh, having people look like everyday life on stage is surprisingly difficult to choreograph and mark out. You have to get people to um, act natural, as it were. Uh, big crowd scenes. Um, you know, uh, natural and organic movement, not just standing at the front of the stage and reciting to the audience, but talking to each other 
and creating the illusion that you're just peeking through that fourth wall, that you're just showing up on a Tuesday and looking into their house. One of the primary visionaries for this is George II, the Duke of Saxe-Meinigen, his awesome beard there, a uh, pretty righteous beard. He was uh, a royalty and he owned the company of actors and he got to boss them around. I'm sure many directors since have wished for the same sort of authority over their actors. Uh, but he was known to have done elaborate stagings, very realistic. Uh, he was interested in things feeling organic and feeling natural. Um, big production side. Uh, you may read on page 174 here that he uh, had a stuffed horse on stage for a battle scene. Um, but, uh, you know, they did a lot of Shakespearean plays. It says here that he toured with Julius Caesar and Constantine Stanislavski, who we talked about in the acting chapter, uh, was very heavily influenced by the Duke's naturalistic staging, the realistic staging uh, that he did in Europe at the time and then um, in Eastern Europe. And uh, Stanislavski took his inspiration from uh, the Duke of Saxe-Meinigen and ran with it. So what we would generally think of as the first modern day director, the first uh, one to just be a director and to also uh, focus heavily on staging would be George II, the Duke of Saxe-Meinigen. And even though he did, wasn't as diligent about writing down all of his theory and uh, sort of solidifying it, Stanislavski, who took a cue from Meinigen, really blazed the path and started what we would think of today as a modern, a modern day uh, director. So of course, I have to kind of dip in to my what I'm going through right now we're on page 175 with before rehearsals begin and the first thing that uh, we get to is script analysis script analysis we talked about this a little in the playwriting section a lot of what you do is you sit down and you say what does this play mean and how can I bring out the meaning for the audience which is kind of funny when you're working on <laughs> Alice in Wonderland because uh, it's nonsense <laughs> uh, and they make very much fun of anybody who tries to put a meaning uh, you know the the Red Queen is always looking for the moral of the story and he, he kind of mocks the idea of having morals and stories. So when you're dealing with absurdist work, so it has some strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I very much think that the imaginative nature of Alice's and Adventures in Wonderland is what drew it to me. I um, have always had an active imagination. I grew up uh, in the 80s with the labyrinth and a um, lot of fantasy. Uh, you know, I loved unicorns when I was little. And so the sort of limitless, expansive, imaginative side of Alice in Wonderland is really uh, what drew it to me. Uh, I had to cut the script in half when I started the script work. I really liked the version of the story that was pretty true to the books, but it was an hour and a half long. And I, uh, traditionally, our children's show has only been 45 minutes. And, and honestly, kids can't really handle much more than 45 minutes. So when I was deciding what scenes to cut and what scenes to keep in, uh, I really kind of drew towards those imaginative moments. There's a moment in both the novels and in the uh, play when a, a leg of lamb, a mutton, grows wings and flies away. And I just had to leave that in there because that's the sort of thing when I was young that really would have just um, sparked my imagination and would have uh, really uh, just delighted me to think that those absurd but imaginative things can happen. Kind of a weakness, I'm going to jump back and forth between the strengths and the weaknesses, uh, is I kind of feel like Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is not plot driven. It is a story that was written to please children and uh, I really think that it was not as interested in having a clear beginning, middle, and end. And um, the adaptation that I picked has her kind of going through different squares more clearly 
the Broadway version that you watched is is less so, but the adaptation that I have, it really says, okay, you're going to go to the fourth square, Tweedledee and Tweedledum are there. You're going to go to the fifth square and meet the White Knight. It really walks people through the plot of it. As arbitrary as that is, though, it's not like Tweedledee and Tweedledum give Alice some sort of item or initiative that, that catapult her into the next square. So it that's one thing that is kind of a weakness of the script in general, is that it tends to lack a clear plot or have people on the edge of their seat. It's not it's not a uh, a very compelling storyline. Memorable characters. That's really, you know, the Mad Hatter and the Queen of Hearts, these just epic characters. So many artists are drawn to Alice in Wonderland. There have been so many adaptations in the last hundred years um, because it's just so fun to play with these dynamic characters. You should have seen the actors scrambling to get to play the Mad Hatter because it is such an iconic role and such a fun, um, lovable personalities or love to hate them in the case of the Red Queen, the Queen of Hearts. Another kind of weakness goes along with the lack of plot, and that is the ending. I really had trouble staging it uh, when I sat down with my bookwork to kind of say, how are we going to end this? Um, you may remember she wakes up from her dream, uh, saying, you're nothing but a pack of cards when the card soldiers are chasing her. And in theater, uh, that would be kind of considered a deus ex machina, which means um, a contrived ending. Uh, contrived solution. Oh, she just wakes up and then it's over. So to sort of bolster that, I have a trick. All of the students on stage are going to throw cards in the air so that it kind of creates a more climactic moment than the moment that's written in the script or in the story. Um, it has that uh, sort of, it was all just a dream ending, which can feel a little bit cheap, but uh, I think I think for children it's it's not hopefully not quite as big of a deal um, okay so those are some of my students there at the bottom uh, this was just a promo picture day so not everybody is there and not all the costumes are completely finished but it gives you kind of a good idea um, I felt like because Alice in Wonderland is such a hodgepodge anyway uh, it was going to be okay to take some of the more Disney character aspects and then some from the Tim Burton and then others uh, from just more classic looking like the Tenniel photos um, it's always a good idea when you're staging a production to kind of look at other productions and how they've been staged. If you go to your local library, they have books that have uh, script notes from maybe when the old Vic did it in London. And uh, just kind of, you know, stealing from other uh, productions is kind of a fun uh, place to start or to know that you don't want to do that and to completely be different. You know, if something just ran in your town three years ago and they took that exact same interpretation, then you're going to have a hard time um, feeling original in what you're working on. Uh, you know, that's kind of the cool thing about Alice in Wonderland, though, that there are knights in shining armor from the, you know, Middle Ages, and then there are modern day Hatter. So it's really already feels kind of like Chronicles of Narnia, sort of this uh, not in a set time because it is a dream. So obviously the Disney version is what most people are going to come in recognizing and looking for. That caterpillar costume there and the blue is is the Disney costume. It's, you know, straight off of the shelf and the Cheshire Cat being fuchsia and purple. Um, it is pretty much the Disney costume exactly represented. Um, and those characters are both pretty short uh, little scenes and so you know, tapping into that Disney icon is going to hopefully um, make the scene more fulfilling for my audience. Uh, but it's worth noting too that I'm not going to use Disney music, can't use the Disney choreography or anything like that. It's all copyrighted and intellectual property of the people who created it. So even though we're renting these costumes that are very close to the costumes we see in the movies, uh, there, that's only to a certain extent that we can rely on their interpretation. The Broadway version, um, 
that uh, you have watched here in D2L. Um, you can see there that the white queen with her white chess hat, uh, very similar to that. And I use some of the um, set ideas like the big hookah pipe, uh, you know, got inspiration from the Broadway. And then the Mad Hatter costume, uh, you can see he's pretty similar to the Tim Burton and we are going to make his hair orange. It's just too fun of an interpretation of a character not to kind of draw some visual cues from. Um, but you know, I watched all of these versions and more. You would not believe how many interpretations of Alice in Wonderland there are out there and how different they are from production to production. So, and then obviously the original author, Lewis Carroll, uh, you know, I read those original books through the looking glass. Um, and uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, uh, you know, both of those are kind of hodgepodge together to create this interpretation. The, the tineal drawings were also part of our process. Uh, you know, those iconic images that a lot of the original illustrations, you know, provoke, uh, especially on the set and creating, creating those tineal-like moments. Um, so just take a step back and look at the author's biography. We can usually find a lot of inspiration in a story. Whether authors want to be autobiographical or not, we, we usually do because our kind of psyche seeps through. So sort of um, learning more about the person themselves, which can be kind of frustrating in the literary world when we look at a character like Shakespeare. There's so much we don't know about Shakespeare. We know that he had a son named Hamnet who died, which is probably the inspiration for Hamlet. Um, but, you know, there are years of his life that we don't even know where he lived. Uh, you know, many people, we don't know how they died. Uh, but we do know a lot about Lewis Carroll because he is a more recent in the terms of classical uh, writers. He is a more recent so we know that Reverend Charles Dodgson was his real name and he worked at King College and many people in the Victorian time uh, had a strange relationship with sex. Uh, Lewis Carroll is no exception. He was uh, celibate. Uh, he believed that was his calling, as was many of the instructors at King's College. There is sort of some speculation because he wrote this story for a little girl named Alice Lytle and that was one of his co-workers daughter and so there's been some kind of question about maybe his sexual morality and whether or not he was trying to appeal to this young girl um, but in the Victorian times children were really being honored Queen Victoria really loved children and um, the innocence of children was a common theme so when he he took pictures of Alice and other young girls um, in various st stages of undress none of the pictures are provocative in any way and I for one think that uh, it was an art as Lewis Carroll is an obvious artist. We know that he was an insomniac, so all of these uh, themes of sleep in the play and the play being a dream uh, would have very much tied into his <laughs> obsession with sleep and the lack thereof. There are many characters, such as the Dormouse, who have trouble staying awake during the day, and there's a lot of comedy that comes out of that. And so, uh, you know, Cheshire Cat is written to be languid and yawning and so this sort of insomniac condition that he lived with probably helped inspire the surreal aspects of the play. Uh, at King College he taught math and there's some inverse relation jokes <laughs> in the play. Uh, if you take a dog from a bone from a dog what should remain the dog's temper would remain ha 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 and there's a lot of inverse you know through the looking glass sort of imagery Tweedledee and Tweedledum are the opposite of each other and a lot of the things that they do are opposites and so um, a lot of the uh, sort of fake way that he talks through logic would have been something he would have been very familiar with. He would have been used to talking logic in a serious way and so to kind of poke fun at it was probably uh, kind of fun for him. He was more intellectualized. 
He loved games. He would make up games. He would stage uh, elaborate games. And this was something that I definitely uh, was drawn to Alice in Wonderland. My family grew up playing a lot of games, card games particularly. And uh, that's one of our favorite pastimes. If we get together for a meal or anything, we have to stay and play a couple hands of cards before we leave. And it's something that I really chose to play up in my production of Alice in Wonderland was the game element. It's it's universal uh, no matter where you are in the world people play games and have fun playing games and uh, it definitely points to the metaphor of Alice playing these social games with the people in Wonderland and we know that Lewis Carroll was socially awkward he had a stammer uh, he wasn't a very popular person but he was of the upper class so he was expected to play these polite Victorian um, society kind of games if you've seen Downton Abbey at all you may um, kind of you know been exposed to some of those Victorian games uh, even though that's a little bit a little bit after Carroll's time but um, you know, and when Alice stands up at the end and says, I'm not afraid of you, you're nothing but a pack of cards, she's kind of refusing to play those those games anymore. And it's um, sort of a pretty deep metaphor uh, when you get into it. And uh, was one of the things that really drew me to the play. So there's Queen Victoria in all of her glory, probably one of the most loved of the British queens. Um, she was the ruler at the time, so some of the matriarchal themes of the play probably came, obviously, from an inspiration from her. The genre of the play, I would say, for at least my per- interpretation, is nonsense poetry. Uh, it is very poetic, lots and lots of rhyming verse. Uh, if you have ever heard some of the nursery rhymes, hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. It, there's no sense to it. It's not, it's just word play. It's just fun with rhetoric. And uh, it's interesting when I started to sit down and look at some of the interpretations of Alice in Wonderland, how many people were trying to interpret or make meanings, deep meanings from uh, the play. And it's just not supported by the script. You know, these Freudian analysis and oh well you know what that mushroom stood for well I don't think that that's necessarily fair I think that's probably putting on top of what Lewis Carroll meant by that and and we'll talk about that later on in the lecture today you know you can still put something on top of what the author intended but knowing the author's intent I think is going to be a key to understanding the script but the genre in general was nonsense and um, just fun Uh, If you look at the play, there's various class structures. Obviously, we have uh, the white chess queen and the queen of hearts and the um, red king, the king of hearts. Those people are constantly ordering around their staff and their butlers and their card soldiers. And there's a very clear class structure. And there are moments in the script where uh, Alice is trying to kind of climb that social ladder and she is treated according to her um, her lack of status that she has and so it, it makes more sense in a Victorian culture many of us today would be appalled uh, the way that the Queen is ordering around her servants uh, but it's very much a piece from the time <laughs> so another common reaction that I get to Alice in Wonderland is oh trippy or what are you going to do about the drug references in Alice in Wonderland and um, there is uh, an illusion in the original stories every time she drinks something she either grows too big or too small that's not in our play at all we've completely cut that out since it's really not practical for the stage but uh Really, I don't think, once again, this is just my interpretation. I wasn't there. I've never met Lewis Carroll. Um, But he was a very religious man, and I don't see much evidence that he was a drug abuser, that he spent a lot of time recreationally or otherwise using any kind of drug. What he did was um, use a lot of uh, 
um, kind of making fun of people in his real life that Alice would have known. Uh, for example, the the white rabbit who's always saying, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. Uh, you know, he admits that he was making fun of one of his fellow colleagues at the university who was always um, in a hurry and running late. And he was also making fun of popular uh, icons at the time, in, including Samuel Coleridge. You may know him... Um, he was a famous author, Water, Water Everywhere, but not a, a drop to drink. You may have heard that from his uh, famous Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Uh, he was an opium addict, and it's said that the caterpillar character was meant to represent Samuel Coleridge and kind of making fun of him and his opium addiction. This was a time when a lot of trading was going on with India, a lot of strife in India, and opium would have been around in this Victorian age. So, all right. So, moving away from Alice in Wonderland, that was my some of my script analysis. But you can see how knowing a little bit about the person helps, uh, or the time that it, the play came out of, helps you to interpret the play in the moment. But moving on to other ways to sort of dissect your script for script analysis. So French scenes. You can see here that someone has taken Barefoot in the Park and said from this page to this page um, is scene one. And in the French, uh, the where this title of this came from is in France uh, before um, printing presses became very popular and when paper was still very expensive they would um, only give the people in the cast their sides only the pages they were on so the reason that they bothered to break it up into French scenes is so that they could save paper and only give people the scenes that they were in only print them the scenes that they were in this is valuable um, for a director because when a person walks into a room they change the tone of that room Right, so if you have a crush on someone and you're acting one way, uh, if that person walks in the door, you might sit up straight or laugh at somebody's joke really loudly so it looks like you're having more fun, you know. Uh, or if I'm teaching a class and, um, you know, the president of my university walks in, her entrance into the room is going to change the nature of the class. Right, so... Um, a great way to dissect a script is according to who's on stage and when they leave or come in that's when things change it's a, a valuable tool for us as um, as script analysis <laughs> so another way to sort of look at beats or a script is to break it down into when does new information come out when does what they're talking about kind of change directions and this happens in our in our everyday conversation uh, you know we'll talk about tell a story or you know talk about when we were young and then we'll kind of change the subject and you can do the kind of the same thing in a play script usually kind of mark out when they change topics or when new information comes up and uh, it actually comes this title of beats actually comes from a misinterpretation because of uh, Stanislavski's really thick accent. He said, you know, you break it down into bits, B-I-T, a single unit of thought, a, a bit, but they heard beat because his his Russian accent uh, was so heavy. And so if we take a scene and sort of break it down into different um, bits of action, this is like the smallest uh, smallest evidence. So you can look on page 178 and see how they've kind of broken it up into different small units of action. Like I said, it's usually when someone changes beats. All right, so moving on to concept. So before you start rehearsals, you meet with your designers and you start to talk about what metaphors, what themes or ideas really come through. There's Tweedledee and Tweedledum there, but the real thing that I want you to see is those cards in the background. As I said, a big metaphor for me is that Alice is playing this game. You can see that Tweedledee is standing in a white square and Tweedledum is standing in a black square. We have that um, 
chasing path uh, in black and white checkerboard throughout the set design because I really do feel like the game image is one that I wanted to play up for my set. I wanted that to be in the forefront of the story once again to enhance the story which I think is a little bit weak but also to um, provide a, a theme kind of being brought out. So as I met with the set designer we really tried to focus on that side of things. Um, so a uh, production concept can be um, you know into the genre of the play which we'll talk more about in one of the later chapters uh, but it can also be a metaphor or an image that you want to bring out to the forefront. As I said Midsummer Night's Dream when I saw it in the Globe Theater it was very earthy and forest there were a lot of twigs and branches there was a lot of mud and that was sort of the concept of that Midsummer Night's Dream whereas when I saw it in Nashville there was a lot of glitter and uh, flitting around and it was modern day costumes lots of flowy fabric it was a very feminine version whereas I would say the one I saw on the globe was more masculine so um, it often uh, boils down to what themes do you want to bring out in the story and uh, what side of the story do you want to tell so kind of pick an angle alright so casting uh, Harold Clerman said that um, casting was the most important job of the act of the director um, it is often very difficult uh, for me as a director to decide who gets what part primarily because I have just so freshly stepped out of the acting business and I know how torturous it can be to get a part that you don't identify with or to feel like someone who got a part uh, doesn't deserve it <laughs> uh, you know or to be cast in a part that you feel like you didn't deserve I've had that as well so um, it's often a decision that has happened in a few days that affects the rest of the the play but well, let's talk about some different strategies for casting some different labels for ways that you cast um, <laughs> so if you type cast someone you may have heard that before type casting it means to hire someone who already has the personality and disposition of the uh, person in question so I say every Meg Ryan movie I say this is a person who has the deepest respect for Meg Ryan I love you've got mail sleepless in Seattle these are the movies that I watch over and over again but she's almost always playing herself or some slightly quirky version of herself um, if you cast someone to type you know if you cast Arnold Schwarzenegger as uh, you know a big burly hero well he already you know has that sort of persona to him so casting to type is the most common way that, that, that we cast in Hollywood. You know, if you want to cast someone who's a surfer, just go out into the beach and find a surfer dude to play your surfer. Um, can be the easiest thing, right? Um, and then there's a bolder choice, which is to cast against type in a pretty obvious way, to hire someone who can't completely meet what the author originally intended for their vision for the story. Um, and this can, once again, bring out different themes. It can be an interesting choice. Uh, one example is to cast an older Romeo and Juliet. You know, can love still have those same themes even at a at an older age, or is it... A, purely a story of youth so it's a pretty um, obvious choice that contradicts what the playwright intended gender neutral casting um, this is often not that you want to pay any particular highlighting to gender but just that for the convenience of the casting you want to make someone gender neutral so there's a very famous American play that came out in the 1950s which was 12 Angry Jurors and uh, it was actually originally entitled 12 Angry Men because it was these 12 uh, men serving jury duty trying to figure out uh, if the man if the person on trial was guilty or not and the entire story takes place in one room it's a very interesting play but all of that to say it's often staged now as 12 angry jurors just so that women can get those parts and it doesn't just uh, have to be men playing those roles because it gives a, a greater chance for women in the business of acting in the business of the theater world having a better chance um, you know it's not unusual in these Shakespeare plays that have all of these men on stage these servants uh, to cast some of them as women 
just because uh, you know back then um, men were more outdoors they were the ones who were uh, pursuing jobs they were the ones in the job market so playwrights wrote for men and often the playwrights were men so they didn't even think about including a lot of women roles so this gender neutral casting it's not that we necessarily dress the women up like men we just take a woman and put her into the role where the sex of the person is not really an issue it doesn't really come into question often um, but then of course there are times when we're very intentional about crossing gender lines and dressing men as women or um, having a woman portray um, the part as a woman uh, that was originally written for a man there was a very famous all-female Hamlet uh, where you know they all just played uh, women and, and change the he's to she's and um, you know it can kind of once again this is a director's way of sort of thumbing the chest of the playwright and challenging uh, current ideas um, colorblind casting uh, is once again more practical it's just not um, not isolating minorities uh, you know if you want a, a really good african-american actor to play the father an asian american to play the mother and then their child is white well in the real world that would never happen right logistically a, a white baby would not come from an african-american father and an asian-american mother but for the sake of the casting process so that no minority gets isolated or left out we just do what's called colorblind casting we ask the audience not to take race into uh, question to just sort of um, cast as if uh, race was not an issue now obviously this works in some plays and not in others uh, obviously Christmas Carol there's it's not a play about race if I were to do an all-white version of Raisin in the Sun uh, you know I would say that's not colorblind uh, that's just murdering authors intent right because that's a play about race and I would say that's a disrespect to the the play itself but some plays don't talk about race at all and so neglecting to cast people of color just because uh, of historical accuracy seems unfair to America as a melting plot and as a job market so you can kind of think of it as um, uh, you know a way to keep it fair the casting pool fair and so we just pretend we're blind and don't see color all right um, now on to the nuts and bolts the um, director during rehearsal uh, and that is blocking moving the actors around on stage you can see there my Alice is here in the foreground she's got her book out ready to write down the directions the stage directions that I give her and um, on stage uh, we are trying to create focus we're trying to put the audience's eye in a certain place a lot of what happens in the rehearsal hall or on stage as we have a stage to rehearse on here for this production is just ask, asking the actor to take um, you know walk up stage left or down stage right when I say those words up stage just means farther to the back away from the audience uh, the theaters used to be built on a slope to make it more visible so if you were traveling up you'd be traveling back away from the audience and then downstage was downhill closer to the audience so that raked stage that slope was upstage downstage and then when we say left or right it has to do with the actors perspective uh, the actors left or right not the directors from sitting out in the house you can see a chart about that on page 183 so how an actor stands on stage um, helps direct visually the people's eye you can see that all three of those ladies are turned and facing um, Alice so the focus in that moment would be to Alice now my white queen is wearing her dress because she has to practice running up the stairs and down the stairs in that big huge dress so uh, she's the focus because she's wearing all white in this moment but <laughs> she won't be when everybody's in costume uh, Selena the one to the far left of your screen she is uh, the focus because everyone is turned and facing her 
Now they're both, every, every actor on stage is cheating out. If we were talking to a person in life to life, we would usually square up with them and be profile or face to face, nose to nose. But on stage, we want to share our energy with the audience. We want to create an open position by turning three quarters out and cheating out to the audience so that they can see our gestures and see our facial expressions um, and sharing that with the audience turning one quarter out is a way to share focus. So the actors are turning towards each other. It's a give and take. Um, It's worth mentioning too that a bad actor steals focus up stages the other people on stage. Um, This is a common occurrence among young actors. They want to be the center of attention all the time. So while one scene is going on they have an overly animated conversation with somebody else on stage or they change the choreography to kind of steal some of the limelight instead of falling in and focusing on the story. I've had young actors uh, fake a limp to try to get more attention on stage. Just these kind of tricks. Uh, It's very unprofessional to upstage or steal focus. Uh, A good actor is a humble servant to the story and they want the audience to catch the story, not necessarily for themselves to get all of the attention or the limelight. Um, So if you turn over to page 184, they talk about different ways to establish order. This is particularly important in big, huge scenes. You want audience to know where they ought to look. So you can see that the Mad Hatter is standing off to your far right there and everybody else is on the left. And so ideally, people will be looking at the Mad Hatter because it's everybody versus him. Um, We call that contrast in staging. Uh, It's everybody versus him. Some other kind of tricks is triangulation there. You can see the person at the apex of the uh, triangle uh, is usually the one who gets the focus or levels the one who's at the top. Um, There are parts of this scene when the queen standing up tall, my Queen of Hearts and King of Hearts need to be the focus and them being up high in different ways that the staging works out can be helpful to creating focus there. I'm thinking particularly uh, of the Cheshire Cat scene. Uh, the Cheshire Cat is always up high because when she's on stage she she takes the, takes the stage and is the most important um, element. So um, it's just ways for people to focus their eye. We don't want people to miss part of the story because they're paying attention to something they shouldn't be. You know, Ariel there in the red shirt, if she were picking her nose, then people would be looking at her instead of paying attention to what the Mad Hatter is saying. And that would be bad because they might miss some element of the story that's important. Uh, you know, costume designers do this a lot when they create focus in a story. If they have a big, uh, huge scene where everyone one is um, on stage at the same time, they'll put their main character in a bright red dress or a bright white dress to sort of draw the eye to or pull the attention or focus to that person who uh, is wearing the loud color. Uh, that can help tell the story as well. But uh, we're talking strictly as directors. Another way that we can do that as a director is put more light on uh, the person, spotlight the person who is carrying the action or the story. Um, Just as an artist, when they're painting a picture, creates focal points with a red triangle or um, a beam of light, directors try to create visual art through staging and helping people uh, look where everybody else is looking. And obviously one of the biggest tricks I have here is that everybody is turned and facing the Mad Hatter. So where everybody else is looking, us as you know, hunters and in our lives, uh, you know, in our historical, we're, we have the instinct to look where everybody else is looking because, uh, you know, you have to be careful in the wild. So we kind of use people's instincts against them as well. So that's just a little tiny bit about staging. So much more to it, creating stage pictures to tell the story. Um, Uh, but I could talk for days about staging. So we'll just move on to our last kind of little bit, which is interpretive versus creative directors. So an interpretive director is a director who takes what the playwright intended and tries their best to honor it. 
And some plays really speak to this. A lot of those American poetic realism, such as the picture uh, with the go to her who is Sylvia, the Edward Albee play, uh, you know, these plays kind of tend themselves towards an interpretive uh, director, someone who just takes what the playwright asks them and then creates it. Whereas the play Midsummer Night's Dream, which you'll be uh, studying for your character analysis, is much more creative driven, right? Uh, you almost have to create some sort of concept on top of it. Oh, and there's a picture there of Midsummer Night's Dream uh, with these alien looking fairies. Interesting, interesting. Um, but you create a strong concept, a strong uh, overstory to kind of pile on top. This picture that I've put here on your slide is of a psychedelic version of Midsummer Night's Dream. It has a lot of those jewel tones and uh, you can see those fabrics very heavily influenced from India um, and that creative setting that wasn't what Shakespeare originally wrote he knew nothing about the 1960s when he wrote a Midsummer Night's Dream so that's a concept that we're putting on top of what the playwright intended uh, it may be in some way inspired obviously dream psychedelic dream those things are related but they're putting a different spin on what the author originally uh, intended. I would argue that some of the productions of Alice in Wonderland that I've seen, uh, you know, that are a little bit more dark or uh, hipster kind of looking, th those are obviously um, concept productions. Uh, they're not of what the original author intended. I really enjoy uh, creative or concept productions, especially for plays that I've seen a, a bunch of times, such as the Shakespeare plays. Uh, many of us in the theater world have seen them over and over, so seeing something new with it is kind of exciting. Uh, you know, Henry V told as if it were set in Iraq with soldiers and machine guns. Uh, you know, it's kind of a fun way of retelling it. I, you know, last we talked about. Uh, uh, playwriting we showed images from Boz Lerman's Romeo and Juliet that was set on the beach with those beautiful um, you know Hawaiian shirts and guns and things like that those are concept creative directors creating um, a new level to the story in their interpretation uh, I would say that for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland I have been an interpretive director pretty much sticking to the story or script but um, Either one has its place. Uh, either one is um, acceptable for different kinds of plays. So that's just a small glance into the world of directing. Hopefully uh, you've learned a little bit about Alice in Wonderland. You've learned a little bit about my style as the director, or my interpretation, uh, and the job as a whole. Um, you know, I really think that uh, directing is something that's overlooked in our culture. If you look at uh, your favorite movie, for example, you might go find that a certain director directed that who directed a lot of other plays, uh, movies that you like. It's kind of one of the unsung roles in many directors today don't get the credit for really the artistic input and the vision that they have. So directors and producers, you may want to go and look that up and see if you can find other plays, uh, sorry, movies that you like based on the director because uh, they're really the guiding force in uh, much of today's movie making industry. So anyway, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture and thank you for listening.